Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today we are reviewing the new Dune movie, Dune 2021, or as it's now known, Dune Part 1. Um, so if you guys aren't aware... I already reviewed both the Dune book that came out in 1965. Uh, the, it's divided into three parts by Frank Herbert. It's a landmark piece of sci-fi. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend you read it because there are going to be spoilers in the later parts of this review. I also reviewed simultaneously the 1984 David Lynch Dune movie. That was a mixed adaptation of Frank Herbert's landmark epic. Uh, <laughs> and, I'm just going to get right to it. This is a better remake. This is a better um, adaptation. Flat out. Absolutely loved it. If you like Dune, like you really like Dune, this is the adaptation you have been waiting for. It has... I, I was new to the Dune universe, quite frankly. Um, I haven't read all the other books yet. I've only read the first one. I've heard good things about the rest. I'm looking to pencil it in. I've heard, I've heard that God Emperor of Dune is, like, really, really good. Dune Messiah is pretty good. I will get to it eventually. But for now, Dune will have to be just one book for me. And judging it based on that book, this is basically a one-for-one. One. This is well, not quite a one-for-one, one, but as close to a one-to-one -one adaptation of book-to-movie as you can get. It adapts... The first part of Dune. If you don't know, Dune is split into three books. Like, three parts. And this is basically the first part. All of it. Completely as an entire movie. And I think that is perfectly good idea. Like, trying to cram Dune into a two-hour movie is why Dune 1984, for those of you who haven't seen it, has a decent first act, and then a second and third act that run like a clip show of Dune. With, like, the character being shuffled around in order to fit the clip show. You just can't adapt something this massive with this much complexity and so much going on effectively in a two-hour time limit. Which is why this movie, the new movie, chooses to adapt the first part of Dune. Now, for those of you who might be angry because I spoiled something, trust me, it's not a spoiler. This might be a surprise if you haven't seen the movie, but it's not going to spoil anything for the movie itself because you get told this up front. I actually really like that because... A lot of people liked the idea of, well, before we saw It Part 2, when It Part 1 came out, and everybody was like, oh, it's It. No, it's just It Part 1, because at the end it was like, Part 1, get ready for Part 2. Unlike that, it doesn't wait till the end to tell you, oh yeah, the movie's over early. It says, up front, when the title comes up, Dune, Part 1. I very much appreciate it. It's just a little small thing I had to call out. I enjoyed them telling me up front, so I could basically know what I was getting into. As I saw you read the movie, I assumed, okay, so we're going to get up to the... We're going to get all the way through the betrayal of... The betrayal. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. Those of you who know Dune, know already know what I'm talking about. So, I already knew what to expect, basically. But I was really amazed at how well they captured his world. Um, the 1984 movie does a pretty good job of the limitations of the era. You know, special effects, just the way movies were done back then. They didn't do a lot of two-parters, that kind of thing. But I have to say, this is just a flat-out better adaptation. You might like the Dune 1984 adaptation, but this is a better adaptation of Dune the novel. Um, if you want to argue with me on that, feel free. That's my opinion. Um, one thing I was worried about, and those this is we're getting to like special effects now. It was special effects because you know newer movies do have their drawbacks. There's less practical effects. I think the CG is good. It's all very good. I think the desert is good. Um, the one thing I was going to, the, the one thing I wasn't sure on is, despite my problems with the old Dune movie, I really liked their puppet worms. They had the open mouths, and they were kind of like these giant lumbering masses. I very much liked them. And when I saw the pre, the promotional material for this, with the, you know, Dune standing over, uh, Paul Atreides, uh, with the giant Mongolian death worm, rows and rows of spiked teeth look, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. But seeing it in the movie, I have to say, it works. Whatever my problems might have been with the original promotional material, that scene in particular, 
in the context, it looks good. The CG is all good. It's all nice and cr- it's all nice and good, uh, crisp, and it doesn't look out of place. Honestly, the ornithopters were a really cool design. Um, the one thing I was a little weird about was they did like kind of the ornithopter design for the hunter seeker drone, but that's just a small aesthetic thing, and I think it makes it look more cohesive with the rest of the technology in the film. Um, they really captured that this is a world that has fast, you know, teleportation, space travel using the Spacer Guild, but they still have a very feudalist society, which is kind of the charm of Dune, you know? It's this highly advanced world in a sort of archaic political structure. <clears throat> but I'm getting into, you know, talking about the movie. So let's go ahead and get into the acting. Uh, the guy playing Paul is Timothy Chalamet. Chalamet? Uh, he's great. I actually really liked him as Paul, especially when he has his... When stuff happens in the third act, I'll talk about more spoilers. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson is Lady Jessica. She's really putting in a great portrayal. Leto, Oscar Isaac as Duke Leto, he's alright. Like, he's not bad, but he just... He, there's nothing stand out with him. Um, Gurney, the guy playing Gurney, Josh Brolin, um, is good. Dave Bautista actually plays the nephew of Baron Harkonnen. I actually really like that. It was like, oh, it's Drax. Um, yeah, that was pretty cool. And uh, what else? What else? Oh, Jason Manoa. Aquaman plays Duncan Idaho. Like, there was, so I want to go see this with my dad. And uh, when we saw Duncan uh, during one of the scenes, my dad was like, wait a second. Is that Aquaman? It's like, yeah, I think it is. <laughs> It's Jason Momoa. <laughs> the last thing I saw him was Aquaman. We both saw him in Aquaman, so I was like, "What the heck is this?" Uh, so that was a that was a weird surprise, yeah. Um, but the real standout when it comes to the acting, I have to say, the true standout for me was um, Stellan Star Starsgad. I think that's how I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I apologize. As the ba- Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, because. I hated the guy who portrayed the Baron in um, Dune 1984. Like, I'm not sure if it was the direction or his own acting choices, but the whole maniacal, I'm laughing, ha, 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 floating around the, floating around the room thing was just not Baron Harkonnen. He just seemed like a freaking cartoon villain. Um, when, you know, he had such a menacing presence in the book. But this actor nailed it. Completely nailed it. I look forward to seeing him as the continuing villain in the later parts, you know, to uh, in the next part of the movie. Uh, I think it's going to have a second part, and then we're going to have a sequel, Dune Messiah, I believe, is the current plan they're working with. We're also going to have a spin-off series of uh, Duke's Dune Sisterhood on HBO Max. So, for those of you who wanted Dune content, looks like they're making the Dune Expanded Universe a thing, which I am all for. Seriously, if you want to make all the Dune books, movies, that gives me an excuse to review them. So, you know, I'm happy. Um, yeah. So that's basically all the actors. The effects are good. The This is, like, a really true adaptation. If you're not willing to listen to spoilers yet, if you want to just go see it blind, you know, and you're about to tune out, I highly recommend go see it. Even if you haven't read the book, I think this is such a faithful adaptation that it can make people truly want to enjoy the book. Um, because when an adaptation is a very accurate adaptation... It can really inspire people. You know what? I like more detail on this. I want to read it or listen to an audiobook or something like that. And for any of you who want to, I will be including a link to my old review with Dune, uh, the Dune book and the old Dune movie in the, in the show notes. I will also be including links where you can buy the Dune book and the link to the HBO Max thing because apparently it's simultaneous streaming. Um, so, you know, if you think you, if you like sci-fi, If you like really complex, interesting worlds, if you like political power structures in a sci-fi world, if you like cool concepts, uh, or even if you just like subversion, because Dune in its own way is a subversion of a lot of the sci-fi tropes of its time, you should definitely check this out. I highly recommend it. I think this is an amazing adaptation. There's not much else to say there. So, from here on out, we're going to spoilers. I would recommend, if you haven't already read the book, going in blind, because there's a lot of twists and turns here. Um, but yeah, that's about it. All right. So let's just talk about how to best this start. So I've been thinking about how to best go about talking about this because I'm going to start by talking about its relationship to the book. 
I know, I know, I should be talking about this as a movie on its own, but I think it's important because this is an adaptation of a very important landmark sci-fi book. So, when it comes to the book, it's actually easier to talk about what this thing leaves out than what it than what it uh, includes. There are only a few minor plot points, such as Jessica being suspected as a spy by everyone, but Leto secretly trusts her, and the fact that um, the audience in the book knows that... Um, House Harkonnen's spy is UA, and we're just waiting for him to turn the whole time. It has a very Shakespeare kind of vibe in the book, where it's like a tragedy. It's like a Greek or Shakespearean tragedy, where we all know everything's doomed. It's just watching exactly how we all know, like a general idea of how it's going to happen. But we just want to see what the cloud damage will be. Um, and the original Dune book's first act really had the feeling of a tragedy. I get that less from this part because they don't. Like, we don't have those uh, scenes where the Harkonnens are talking about, yes, we have a traitor in their midst, and the traitor's name is Yui. And then you see the doctor in the next scene tending to Paul, and like, oh my god, is he going to kill Paul? What's going to go on here? Um, that's how Doom felt to me a lot of times. Like, whenever Yui came into a, a scene in the book, I was just like, oh my god, so when is he going to turn? When is he going to turn? But now that I'm watching a movie, I already know when he's going to turn, although I wasn't, you know, 100%. Sure, the movie's going to keep that. They did. They kept the timing very well, actually. Uh, the, the timeline is basically one for one here. It just with a few other events that didn't couldn't fit in, not in there. But it almost feels like they could literally just be deleted scenes <laughs> at that point. Um, and the other thing, aside from those two, was... Uh, what was it? Oh, that one a few lines from Paul and from Yui... That got cut out, like Yui's monologue to the Harkonnen, and also Paul's monologue about how the spice has poisoned them all. Although he does his other, you know, breakdown emotional rant uh, at the end of the, you know, the third act. And uh, yeah, I've talked about this plot a lot, so I'm mostly going to be going over the movie from this point on. If you'd like to hear my opinions on the book, uh, you can again check that review in the show notes. So, this movie, really good. I like a lot of the differences between the older movie in that, um, I like the old movie where we only got a few inside shots of their old home on, like, this, you know, very tropical north northern land with a lot of water and life. You get extensive shots in the beginning of vast lakes of water the heart the Atreides rule over, and these lush meadows where the graves are, and, the, you know, Leto visits his father's grave, or Paul's just thinking on the, on the shores of a small lake. You know, this kind of Scotland-esque vibe. And it really juxtaposes so harshly with Dune's inhospitable desert. Um, and it really does. I, I genuinely think that those scenes are important. They establish that the Atreides are coming from a world, like a lot of hospitable worlds, like a lot of worlds humans live on, that water is a, a common resource. And on Arrakis, it's not. Um, they even kept the scene where they meet with some, the Leto and his generals meet with the Fremen and the Fremen spits in front of them and the general that's been there the whole time, um, what was his name? Oh yeah, it was, um, Duncan has to like, be like, no, 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 sir, sir, uh, it's a measure of respect. And he spits on the ground, it's like, we accept your water. And, you know, Leto has to like spit and he feels a little grossed out by it. But to them, it's a measure of respect because in a world where a thimble of water with a steel suit, a thimble of water can keep you alive for a day. So a single drop of spit is like half to a full day of life that you just gave up. That's, that's like saying, I'm going to take all the expenses it takes to keep a human alive for one day and I'm going to throw it on the ground and burn it. You know? Um, and they also keep the things like when uh, Paul has to beat someone in a single combat near the end of the movie, uh, they wrap his body up tightly, preserving the water, and they carry it back with them. Because this is a this is a whole person. We have to drain the blood. We have to gather the spit from the mouth. We have to do everything we can to preserve every last drop of water. Because a whole person just disappearing into the sands would be a tragedy. Um, and the Fremen have very different customs. The movie is also a lot more blatant than the, uh, this movie is a lot more blatant than the old 1984 movie about the Fremen's parallels with, uh, like, Middle East countries. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's, it's not hard to draw the parallel with Frank Herbert. It's a desert territory constantly being invaded by foreign powers that has access to a powerful resource. Um, and then there's, you know, all the religious overtones of it all. They're very specifically drawing those parallels of, you know, oil in the Middle East. 
And um, he uses it as a framework for a deconstruction of the, uh, you know, the space messiah, basically. You know, that old trope where some superhuman uh, chosen one leads a, you know, leads a fallen alien people to freedom and overthrowing. Um, and in Dune, it's meant to be a bit more tragic, especially in this movie. I'm not going to really get into the future stuff, but for example, um, the Bene Gesserit have been trying to breed the Quidet, Quizet Satirat, which is basically their, like, ultimate genetic achievement. They've been breeding bloodlines, training superhuman abilities in the mind. They can, like, persuade people with, like, a Jedi mind trick, but a lot more aggressive. And... They've been trying to create the Kwisatz Haderach, the ultimate one. But to aid this, they've also seeded various planets' religions with the myths about both themselves and the Kwisatz Haderach, planting him as a messiah figure in a lot of cultures. That way, whenever the, the Kwisatz Haderach does appear on any of those planets, they can literally call the planet to rally around them in a religious fervor and just gain an entire group of followers. It's literally reli- direct. Um, Paul even calls his mother out on it, that they, you know, basically brainwashed a planet into believing a lie. But she says, no, it's not a lie, because we basically guarantee that one of these days, one of you will eventually happen, and they're going to make sure the rest happens. Um, and it's meant to show that those, you know, that you follow like that, that, you, that have this kind of idealized um, respect, might not always have those other people best interest in heart. And... Paul has to reckon with what he will do because he has a moment in the tent when he's, you know, awakening, when his full powers are awakening because he's finally being exposed to the large... uh, This is after there's a big rebellion. The Harkonnens kill basically everyone else and Paul and his mother are thrown into the desert and have to survive. Um, One, the first night in the tent when they're trying to, you know, eke out, Paul is finally awakening as the spice thrums in the air. He finally awakens his full powers and he basically gains a form of semi-omniscience. And he sees the future. He sees what he's going to do. Burning bodies, desolation, his old homeworld, the Fremen being brought there and gasping at the water, him leading them onward to call their bloody, co- bloody gashes throughout the cosmos. He's going to lead them to do terrible things. He's going to slaughter hundreds of thousands of people in his crusade for revenge and to eventually take the throne. And he knows he's going to do it because he wants that revenge. But at the same time, he's haunted by all the things he's going to do that he hasn't done yet. But he knows that even though he knows he could stop, he could let it go. He could literally just let the Harkonnens win and thousands more would not die. But he chooses to do it because it is what he wants and the consequences aren't enough. He will use the Fremen, no matter how much he ends up respecting them in the end. He will become their messiah, and he will carve a path straight to the Emperor and the Harkonnens to get revenge. Um, and he has to then grapple, hopefully in the next movie, he'll have to grapple with the consequences of that, of leading that further. Um, his mother has to deal with the consequences of his own, her own son calling her and, you know, the Bene Gesserit and his own father out on basically creating him. They, he's going to do this all. He is going to do it. But he's only here to do it because they basically made him to. The Bene Gesserit created someone and created the conditions where this was essentially always going to happen. Even if it wasn't him, the, the Reverend Mother even says, even if he is not the one, we have dozens of other, com- you know, other options. Um, and the Bene Gesserit go to links to make sure he has at least a fighting chance of making this happen on a world where he'll be able to gather an army. A very dangerous one. They're complicit in this. Everyone is. Everyone was complicit in this. The Fremen's deceit, and even the Fremen themselves, who are angry at the Harkonnens, who would like to see their world become a paradise. Um, and, you know, that's all very heavy, but you also get to see some sci-fi stuff. You know, giant worms, uh, magical MacGuffin material, the spice, which extends life, gains psionic abilities, allows the calcul- allow the minds to do the calculations necessary to do space travel. All really fun stuff. This is a big sci-fi epic. Um, it's very somber in tone, though, but mostly near the end. There's a bit of... There's a bit of hopefulness in the early scenes, which I wasn't expecting, because I thought this thing would be really self-aware about how doomed everyone was. But 
No, at the beginning, the, they really act like they're, you know, making progress. And they genuinely... Like, they, the characters aren't, like, self-aware of how doomed they are at first. Um, that changes during the coup. The Harkonnens are secretly being backed by the Empire, who are worried the Arca- are, uh, the Ar- Atreides will gather the other great houses and try and overthrow him. He's paranoid, so he's giving him his elite guard. The combined with the Harkonnens forces... They attack and destroy the Har- the Atreides forces, and Duke Leto is captured. He tries to kill Baron uh, the Baron Harkonnen with a poison tooth given to him by Yui, because Yui knew that his wife was most likely dead, even though she was doing this to save her from the Harkonnens, because they had captured her and were torturing her. He knew she, she was probably dead, and they were going to kill her one- once they were done with him. And if they did that, he was going to make sure that the uh, Duke Leto had a poison tooth to try and kill Vladimir, uh, the Harkonnen. He doesn't. He kills an entire room of his servants, but he doesn't kill Harkonnen himself. He manages to survive. Uh, I'm still upset they didn't have Yui's little monologue, because I really like that monologue from the book. And, like, the Harkonnen's inner thoughts on what can he mean? What does he mean? I'm going already dead. He's just a dead man. He's just a dead man. I, I just really like that monologue. Sorry, it's just personal like I wish they had included in the movie. I hope there's like a deleted scene on the DVD. <laughs> that would be nice. But yeah. Um, so, you know, the Harkonnens try and desolate them. Uh, they take refuge, refuge with some Fremen at this research facility. The Imperial Surveyor, who's been overseeing the transfer and who's been ordered to keep silence about all this, um, decides to help them out. Which, you know, is nice. He's uh, Dr. Kynes, who, fun fact, is a woman in this. Uh, I was not expecting that. But you know what? She does a great job with the role. I think she really plays Kynes well. Uh, her name was Sharon Sher- Sharon Duncan Brewster. Uh, okay, last name. Interesting last name. <laughs> uh, cool last name. Uh, who am I to judge? Anyway, uh, she's great in the role. I don't think there's a big problem with casting her as a female, even though she's the male in the book. That's just not a problem with me, personally. Um She's great for the role. She really plays Kynes well. So, you know what? As long as there's good acting and, she, you know, it does justice to the material, who cares? Uh, I know there are probably some hardcore purists like, you have to do everything like the book. I'm like, you, know, you can make changes as long as they're not interfering with the main themes and plot. Um, and, yeah, everything kind of works out. Although I'm a little confused as to what happened with Thufir Hawat, uh, the Mintat, the kind of, like, super advanced, like, they're basically, like, uh, you know, they've been mentally trained sort of like the Bene Gesserit, but they can, like, do calculations and are very logical, like, think Vulcans, basically. I yeah. Human-created Vulcans, basically. Uh, and he's supposed to, like, sort of start working for the Harkonnens because he wants revenge on Je- Jessica because she thinks he was a traitor. She was a traitor due to a bunch of stuff that was going on in the background that they didn't have time for in the movie. I'm interested to see if they're still going to have that. They're going to try and work that into the second movie. So, you know what? Something to look forward to. But, yeah. Um... I long since thought that this was a movie that you just couldn't do. But you know what? Dune 2021 proved that at least the first part is entirely doable. And I'm looking very much forward to the second part. Please do not mess this up like you did the adaptation. Uh, Because whenever you get a two-part adaptation, there's always a problem where one part is not great a lot of the time. Uh... (laughs) Looking at you, It Part 2 and Hunger Games, uh, Hungry, the third Hunger Games book, Part 1. You know, Catching Fire Part 1, Catching Fire Part 1. It's just, yeah. So, fingers crossed, the next one will be good. Can't wait to see it. Highly recommend this movie. 9.5 to a 10 out of 10. You know what you want? As an adaptation of Dune, 10 out of 10. This is, I think, the best you could have done with this material. I genuinely think this is the best you could have done on a Dune Part 1. And I think that even if there is another Dune movie later on, this will be the Part 1 that people will remember. Even if they try and do this whole duology thing over and over again, um, and we get like 50 years from now another Dune, you know, double Dune movie to try and make another adaptation, I think this is going to be one of the defining adaptations of Dune as a work of science fiction. Um, And I look very much forward to anything they have in the future. So, yeah. I kind of rambled on about how much I love this adaptation. I uh, hope you guys didn't, you know, tune out for that. Glad you've stuck around this long. Um, so, yeah. 
I've got some other things working in the background in the future. Uh, I've got a surprise that will hopefully be ready for the uh, second or first week of November. I'm going to be revealing that soon, probably in a week or two. I'm trying to get it up. It's something special. It's something fun. I hope you guys stick around for that. As for other things, I'm currently still working on Metroid Prime Dread and Hades. I'm working to get those games finished so I can review them. Um, in the future, next movie is going to be... Or, I mean, the next thing I'm going to review is going to be uh, Sinister Magic. It's an urban fantasy novel by Lindsay Broker. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's basically, hey, this is a, like, magic... So, basically, it's like a world where magic kind of sort of exists. The government denies it. But a lot of humans also know about it in the background. You know, it's like... The average person might not think it's real, but it's one of those things that, like, yeah, if you ask around, like, you know, four out of ten people are going to be like, yeah, I've had some weird experiences. The government just doesn't want to talk about it. Which I know sounds so cringeworthy in our current environment. Don't worry, it was years later. It was years before this world we're in right now. Uh, it's about this basically magical assassin contractor who has, like, his pet spirit tiger she can summon, has to deal with an a-hole dragon who's coming in to try and boss her around. Uh, and, you know, take her contracts away to get face, face dragon justice, which a lot of things seem to prefer death over. It's a fun, quirky kind of book. Uh, very fun. I've always enjoyed urban fantasy. It's probably one of my favorite uh, sh- subgenres of fantasy. It, actually, I think it is my favorite subgenre of fantasy. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. I've really been enjoying listening to it on Audible. So, yeah, look forward to that next week, and I'll see you guys next time. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. And thank you for listening to The Dragon's Library. Please, subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. The Dragon's Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week. And you can follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library 2. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. As always, thank you so much for all your support.